Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is uh, Barry de Graaf and I am Channel Evangelist at Cinecore. This is the third webinar in a series about email security. In this webinar, we will provide practical how-to information and best practices to help you maximize Zimbra email security. In our previous webinars, we have unraveled SPF, DKIM and DMARC and recordings and slide decks of these webinars can be found at the Zimbra blog and the Zimbra YouTube channel. In today's webinar, we will explain how MTA SDS, TLS RPT, and BIMI can improve privacy and confidentiality for email. During this webinar, you can ask questions via the Q&A panel, and I will try and answer them on the fly. Some questions we may also discuss live during the webinar. Today's webinar is recorded and will be published on our blog and YouTube channel, where you can find it for reference. Uh, this webinar is a collaboration between Zimbra and Randy Liker from Skyway Networks. Randy is an expert in email security and he will provide you with all the best practices and insights you need to get started on maximizing your security. So without further ado, I would like to give it to Randy. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um... Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on the third episode in the Zimber webinar series. And this one is all about uh, MTA STS and TLS RPG and Benny, as uh, Barry mentioned. So for those who are joining us on this webinar series for the first time, as a brief introduction, I am the president and CEO of Skyway Networks. Uh, Skyway Networks is a email service provider specializing in Zimber hosting and consulting. Uh, we also provide a variety of cloud hosting services, including software development. Uh, and I've been working in the IT industry for 26 years, and at that time, 23 of those with Skyway Networks. Uh, and I've personally been working with Zimbra uh, dating back to Zimbra version 5.0. So as an overview of today's topics, in the first portion of the webinar, I will be discussing the MTA, STS, and TLS report standards, including everything you need to know to get the most benefit from each. We will be looking at a series of examples illustrating how these avoid sneaky security downgrade attacks against your users. In the second portion of the webinar, the emerging BIMI standard will be discussed. We will look at some use cases for BIMI and when it makes sense to publish a BIMI record for your organization. And at the end of the two portions of this webinar, I will pause uh, and take any questions and try my best to answer those for you. Uh, as Barry mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted for later replay on the Zimber YouTube channel at the URL you see at the bottom of the screen. So this is the third episode in the webinar series about using modern email authentication and encryption to protect your users from a diverse range of threats. Some of those threats include phishing, eavesdropping, information leakage, man-in-the-middle attacks, and security downgrade attacks. In the previous episode, uh, we spoke about SPF, DCAM, and DMARC, uh, and those were covered in great depth. Uh, and this episode will build upon those concepts. Um, but again, in case you need it, those are still out on YouTube for watching anytime. Um, in this webinar episode, I will also refer you to outside documentation and tools where relevant, but the goal here is to get you information that you can immediately use to get started with each security standard within a short time frame without needing to spend days or weeks of reading documentation. So let's, with all that said, let's go ahead and dive into our first topic of MTA STS. So MTA STS is an acronym for Mail Transfer Agent Strict Transport Security. It's about a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it was introduced as a security uh, standard recently in 2018 uh, through collaboration of Google, Oath, Microsoft, and Comcast. Um, its purpose is to address a vulnerability that is easily exploitable in another widely used email security standard called Start TLS. Um, now, Start TLS is used uh, quite widely for encrypting email as it travels across the internet. And MTA SES also declares to email senders if an email delivery should proceed or not, should a recipient server fail to offer encryption. If you joined us for the earlier webinars in the series, you may recall that DMARC offers a similar capability uh, by declaring what email senders should do when SPF and DCAM checks both fail. MTA SDS fulfills a similar need, but this time related to email encryption instead. Uh, and MTA SDS can be quite effective at preventing man in the middle attacks uh, which is one of the leading reasons that email eavesdropping occurs. So shortly, we will learn the circumstances under which these attacks occur and how surprisingly common they are on the internet. 
Uh, I, in fact, I guarantee that everyone on this webinar has already been a victim of one of these types of attacks, most often without realizing it. So to best appreciate what MTA STS offers, some context is needed by discussing what's called opportunistic encryption of email, including what it is and how it works. So according to public statistics published by Google, about 90% of mail servers on the internet today are using opportunistic encryption. This means that when a sender and a recipient's mail servers initially connect, they are doing so over a plain text uh, connection without any encryption whatsoever. Next, the servers negotiate the features they support, including whether or not encryption is available. If both servers support encryption, then the connection is upgraded to be secure. Otherwise, the email delivery continues over plain text, making it trivial for anyone to eavesdrop on the email. And this is the origin of the name opportunistic encryption, as it literally means uh, email will be uh, encrypted when possible, but there is otherwise no uh, requirement that this will occur. Um, so when opportunistic encryption for email was first introduced back in 2002, uh, it promised to make email encryption universal across the internet uh, and simultaneously effortless for end users as no client side changes were needed. Instead, it was only the email administrators that needed to configure their mail servers for a security standard called Start TLS. Now, Zimbra fully supports Start TLS for both inbound and outbound email deliveries, and we will look at how this is configured in Zimbra a little bit later in this webinar. And to make these concepts a little less abstract, uh, let's look at an illustration of how this all works in real world usage. So in this illustration, Jill is sending an email from her phone to one of her clients, Chris, at another company. Now, after Jill's phone hands off her email to her Zimbra server, which in this case is called mail.zimbra.tech, her Zimbra server next connects to Chris's email server using the SMTP protocol with a plain text non-encrypted connection over TCP port 25. Now, Chris's server then replies with a short greeting, including his server's hostname of mail.company.example, and advertises uh, its supported features. Among the features listed is one called 250-start TLS. Now, as soon as Jill's Zimber server sees this feature advertised, it knows that Chris's server also supports encryption. And likewise, since Jill's Zimber server supports encryption, her Zimber server will next send the command start TLS to upgrade to a secure connection. Now, Chris's server will then reply with 220 ready to start TLS, acknowledging that the plain text connection is about to go secure. After some additional SMTP commands sent between the two mail servers, both servers agree upon an encryption protocol and algorithm to use. Then Jill's Zimber server proceeds to hand off her email over the fully encrypted connection to Chris's email server, thereby completing the email delivery. Even though the connection between the two mail servers started out as non-encrypted and was later upgraded to a secured connection using encryption, this still all takes place over TCP port 25. Now let's take a look at what would happen in the instance if encryption is not supported on either Jill's Zimmer server or Chris's mail server. In this illustration, we can see that again, Chris's server is advertising that it has support for encryption with the same 250-start TLS response that we saw in the prior illustration. But perhaps Jill has her Zimmer server misconfigured, uh, thereby preventing it from using encryption. So in this example, Jill's Zimmer server never sends the start TLS command but instead continues on with sending her email over an existing plain text, non-encrypted connection to Chris's server until her email delivery is complete. So with no encryption having been used for this email delivery, any intermediary networks on the internet that Jill's, Jill's email traveled through on its way to Chris's mail server can easily obtain the complete plain text contents of her email. So there's literally zero privacy here. It is very common for traffic on the internet to pass through multiple third-party networks on its way to its destination, providing plentiful opportunities for uh, email eavesdropping and interception. So far, we have seen what happens when both a sender and a recipient use email encryption, and what happens when one or both sides of the connection do not support encryption. Next, let's look at how adversaries attack opportunistic encryption. And when I say adversary, you may be thinking of criminal hacker or perhaps a hostile nation state government. While these bad actors are certainly valid examples, I think the definition of an adversary in this context may surprise you. So in the first example, back in 2014, 
a story came out in the media about a wireless cell phone company called Cricket Wireless that operates in the U.S. and is now owned by AT&T. They were found to be carrying out widespread and secretive man-in-the-middle attacks against their customers by intentionally downgrading their customers' email security. A Cricket Wireless was able to achieve this by setting up network uh, by setting up their network to intercept uh, any SMTP traffic sent by their customers' phones. So that if an email server advertised support for the Start TLS feature, this advertisement would be automatically blocked by Cricket Wireless's network before it could reach the customer's phone. This in turn would cause their customer's phones to always send email without encryption using plain text. This, in, this also allowed Cricket Wireless to then eavesdrop on every single email sent by their customers, uh, regardless of the email server being used. Now, at the time, Cricket Wireless was reportedly performing this security downgrade attack for the purpose of monitoring for outgoing spam activity, but of course, at the very high, price, uh, high cost of jeopardizing their customers' email confidentiality uh, and privacy. And as a second example, there are many companies out there that opt to set up proxies that their employees uh, must use for internet access. And these proxies are sometimes configured to intercept SMTP email traffic. For instance, the popular Cisco PICs and ASA series firewalls all have this capability. Once an SMTP connection is intercepted, if the proxy sees an email server advertising that encryption is available, and after the email sender also sends the start TLS command to bring up a secure connection, Company's proxy can intervene at that point and send a forged response back to the employee's device indicating that a secure connection failed, thereby causing the employee's device to go ahead and proceed sending an email over plain text. Now, companies will often justify this type of policy with the reasoning of needing to monitor all employee communications. Now, a recurring theme that you're going to pick up on in this webinar series, especially if you've joined us for the previous two, uh, it relates to vulnerabilities in the SMTP protocol uh, and the efforts to fix those same vulnerabilities by introducing follow-up security standards. In an ideal scenario, we could replace SMTP with a modern secure alternative, but with this SMTP having been integrated into literally billions of devices worldwide, particularly those with firmware that cannot be upgraded, Replacing SMTP would require complete replacements of all those devices. And this, of course, is simply not a practical option. So the authors of the Start TLS standard understood this reality. And even after introducing Start TLS in 2002 to begin securing email deliveries with SMTP, Start TLS got off to a pretty slow start as it was only deployed on about 30% of mail servers during its first 11 years after it first became a standard. It was not until the public relations effort by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is the same organization behind services like Let's Encrypt, uh, combined with the Edward Snowden mass surveillance revelations in 2013, that Start TLS's usage more than doubled, eventually reaching the 90% usage level uh, of email servers today. So Start TLS is now widely used in many other protocols too, besides SMTP. For example, you will find it used inside of IMAP, POP, FTP, and LDAP to name a few. Azimber also supports Start TLS with an IMAP and POP in addition to SMTP. So as discussed on the previous slide, we saw that an adversary can easily defeat Start TLS as long as they have the capability to be a relay in between an email sender and a recipient, as provided by many firewalls and proxies, which is essentially the definition of a man-in-the-middle attack. An adversary can either block the advertisement of the Start TLS feature from a recipient's mail server, or otherwise forge the responses between a sender and recipient's uh, mail servers, effectively uh, le le leading to what is called a strip TLS attack. This works because all of this takes place over a plain text, non-encrypted connection using SMTP, so it's quite trivial for these devices to uh, tinker and alter the communication stream. It could be argued that this was an oversight on the part of the authors of the Start TLS standard, but it was actually, in fact, intentionally built into the standard as a means to incrementally introduce email encryption on the internet um, over time. Uh, and this works by allowing older email servers to fall back to non-encrypted email deliveries, especially when they cannot support encryption at all. Otherwise, uh, if the, this had been made a requirement that Start TLS cannot fall back uh, to plain text, 
then you would end up with basically two groups on the internet, those running email servers with start TLS and those without, basically completely unable to communicate with each other. So again, that fallback to plain text does actually serve a practical purpose, but unfortunately comes with a very significant downside. So to mitigate these attacks on start TLS, two new security standards were introduced. The first was Dane, and this is an acronym for DNS-based authentication of named entities. And later, a second standard called MTA SDS was introduced, which is the subject of this webinar, of course. Both Dane and MTA SDS take different approaches to solving the attacks on Start TLS. And Dane will be covered in depth in a later webinar. Um, and ultimately, you will want to deploy both Dane and MTA SDS for your mail server as each offers different advantages and they are designed to coexist with, with each other too. So now let's use another example and show uh, how you can set up MTSTS to begin protecting your email server against security downgrade attacks. This is Katie and she has an email address of katie at zimbra.example. She is the email administrator for her company's two Zimbra servers called mail1.zimbra.example and mail2.zimbra.example. Now, before Katie can set up MTA STS, she needs to ensure her Zimbra servers meet the three minimum requirements for MTA STS. First, she will need to verify that each of her Zimbra servers has a valid SSL certificate issued from a certificate authority, which in other words means that self-signed certificates cannot be used in this instance. For instance, that might, this might be a certificate from Let's Encrypt or another commercial certificate authority. Uh, Katie decides to set up one SSL certificate for mail1.zimbra.example and a completely separate certificate for mail2.zimbra.example. Alternatively, she could have gone to a commercial uh, vendor or even Let's Encrypt and obtained a wildcard certificate for asterisk.zimbra.example and installed this on both of her Zimbra servers. But what's really important here is that MTA SCS requires that her Zimbra server's hosting exactly matches the SSL certificate name or one of its subject alternative names inside of the certificate. This is especially important for anybody who has a multi-tenant environment where they may be hosting a very large number of domains on their server. So for the next requirement, Katie needs to check if Zimbra is configured to use Start TLS for inbound and outbound email. To do this, she connects to each of her Zimbra servers using an SSH client like Putty and then switches to the Zimber user with the appropriate command as shown on the slide for either Ubuntu or Red Hat. Next, she runs the zmprov commands shown on screen to check the Zimber MTA TLS security level and Zimber MTA SMTP TLS security level. Um, if either of those commands shows a value other than the word may, that is M-A-Y, she will need to set each of those using the zmprov MMS command then restart postfix within Zimbra using the ZMTA control command. A third requirement of MTA SDS is that TLS 1.2 or higher must be used on the email servers. So Zimbra supports both TLS 1.2 and TLS 1.3. But to check this, Katie runs the command ZMPROV GCF Zimbra MTA SMTPD TLS protocols. She gets a response indicating that it's currently set to a value of greater than equals TLS v 1.2, indicating that her Zimbra server will only use TLS 1.2 or 1.3, which is the latest standard. So this meets the requirement for MTA STS. Now, if it showed a different value, Katie could have used the steps provided in the Zimbra Wiki article shown on screen that my webinar co-host Barry was kind enough to document for us. Now that Katie's Zimbra servers meet all of the requirements for MTA STS, she can now publish her MTA STS policy. To do this, Katie first needs to create a website with the URL of https colon two forward slashes MTA hyphen STS dot Zimbra dot example. For this website, Katie will need to create an SSL certificate issued from a certificate authority, again, as mentioned earlier on the previous slide, the SSL certificate's name or one of its subject alternative names must be exactly mta-sts.zimbra.example. Now within this configuration of Zimbra's, or I'm sorry, within this configuration of Katie's web server, 
such as uh, Apache or Nginx or IIS or similar, she will also need to make sure that her web server can support TLS 1.2 or higher, as again, this is required by MTA uh, SDS. As another example of how this works for subdomains, if Katie's email address were instead katie at mail.simbra.example, then the website Katie would create would instead have a URL of https colon two fort slashes uh, mta hyphen sds dot mail dot zimra dot example. So essentially, as you'll see, the, the pattern here is that it always must be https and it always must use the subdomain of mta hyphen sds. What follows is essentially your domain or subdomain that you're protecting. So next, Katie is ready to create her MTA STS policy file. And within this new website she has set up, she will need to create a subfolder called .wellknown. Now, for those of you using well, uh, Let's Encrypt, this will immediately be familiar because that is, in fact, where a lot of the Let's Encrypt verifications happen. Um, and within this folder, she will need to create a, a single text file with the file name mta-sts.txt. Again, this file name is not arbitrary. It must be called this exact file name in order for email senders to find it. This file will inform email senders what Katie's security policy is for using Start TLS whenever her Zimbra server re uh, receives mail. So within the MTA STS text file, Katie starts with the file with the text version colon space STS v1. And this means that this is an MTA STS policy file using version one, the only version supported on the internet. And this must always be the very first line of the file. However, any of the other keywords I'm about to discuss can be listed in any order. So in the next line of the file, she adds a line mode colon for uh, space testing. The mode keyword has three options available, as you'll see on the right of the slide. Uh, the choices are none, testing, and enforce. The none keyword means that senders will simply ignore the MTA STS policy as though KD never even set it up in the first place. The testing keyword means that senders should retrieve Katie's MTA STS policy, but not actually apply it. And there's some reason for that, which we'll look at later. Instead, Katie will receive email reports from senders indicating how this policy would have been applied to emails sent to Katie's Zimber servers. If you attended the earlier episode in this webinar series on DMARC, this is going to look very similar to how the DMARC policy of none works. Uh, you may recall that with the DMARC aggregate reporting features, this is in fact what starts the DMARC aggregate reporting feature. Um, now we'll discuss this a little bit more detail later in the webinar. Um, and finally, the MTA STS enforce keyword means that Katie requires senders to use start TLS encryption when sending email to her Zimbra servers. So Katie then adds two more lines to the file of mx uh, colon space mail1.zimbra.example and on the next line mx colon space mail2.zimbra.example. These are essentially her two uh, email servers that receive uh, email from the outside internet. And this informs email senders also of the specific host names of the servers that are authorized to accept encrypted email for Katie's domain name of zimbra.example. Now, these host names must always exactly match the DNS MX records that Katie has set up on our DNS server. Again, this is going to primarily be a concern for those doing multi tenant hosting. Um, if Katie were to later add an, addi an additional MX record to her DNS server, later called uh, mail3.zimbra.example, but she, if she forgot to add it to her uh, MTA STS policy file on her web server, then encrypted email deliveries to that new mail3.zimbra.example uh, will simply bounce as undeliverable because it's not in her MTA STS file. <clears throat> so MTA STS offers an option to use a wildcard when listing mail servers. And in this instance, Katie could have combined both lines uh, that we just covered into a single line that says mx colon space asterisk.zimbra.example. And this wildcard would cover both her mail one and mail two servers, but uh, would not include an email server with a name like uh, west.mail1.zimbra.example. So wildcards uh, should be used with caution here, as it also makes it easier for an attacker who, for whatever re the reason, gains the ability to create their own subdomain 
suddenly with a wild card here, you have authorized that attacker's uh, subdomain as well. So uh, it's better to err on the side of caution when possible here and specifically list individual server names um, and limit the use of the wild card as much as you can. So and finally, to finish her MTA STS policy file, Katie adds the keyword maxh colon space uh, 315.576.00. This is the number of seconds that email senders are allowed to cache a copy of Katie's MTA STS policy file before they are required to check for an update on Katie's web server. The value shown is the maximum value allowed by the MTA STS standard, and it basically translates to one year and six hours. So normally, this value should be set to a long time frame of at least a few weeks or longer. Um, Katie next runs a test by requesting the file from her web, uh, web browser on just her desktop computer, and she's using a URL of https colon slash slash mta hyphen sts dot zimmer dot example forward slash dot well known forward slash mta sts text. And the purpose here is to ensure that this policy file is basically a, a accessible by any anonymous user, including any email sender who wants to send her domain email. And she's also, of course, checking to ensure uh, there are no SSL certificate errors as well. <clears throat> so as a last step, Katie needs to add a new DNS text record to inform email senders that she has published an MTA STS policy, because simply posting the file on her website alone is not enough. So to do this, Katie will need to add a DNS text record with a host name of underscore mta hyphen sts dot zimbra dot example. She starts this DNS text record with the keyword uh, v equals sts v1 semicolon. And this indicates that, again, this is an mta sts record and that is using version one, the only version supported on the internet. And next, Katie adds the ID keyword with an alphanumeric value of her choice. Now, most mta sts implementations they tend to treat this ID number as a serial number. It doesn't need to be a number necessarily. It can be a mix of letters and numbers if you wish. Um, but Katie, in this case, opts to use a fairly common format, and she ends up using the uh, uh, format of year, month, day, and revision number. So Katie enters ID equals 2022-05-10-01, that being for the year 2022, May 10th, revision one. Now, if Katie ever needs to update her MTA SDS policy file on her web server, she should first make the desired change on, into that file uh, before doing anything else. Then, on her DNS server, she would simply change that ID value to something else. Because again, remember, it doesn't need to be a number. It could be any alphanumeric string. So as long as it changes to something different, that's all that matters. Um, so email senders will frequently check this ID value in her DNS record. And if they see it change, this will prompt them to immediately request Katie's new policy file from her web server, even if the max age value in her policy file has not been uh, reached yet. So now <clears throat> let's circle back to the earlier dis uh, discussed attacks against start TLS. But this time, let's see what happens when MTA SDS has been set up on Katie's Zimmer servers. So Chris sends Katie an email from time to time about a project their two companies are working on. Now, Chris needs to send Katie an email update with some sensitive information uh, from his computer in his office. But what Chris is unaware of is that a criminal hacker has recently compromised an out-of-date software on his uh, company's network firewall and is basically silently intercepting all traffic passing through it. The hacker's malware is additionally blocking all start TLS commands for any email sent from, uh, sent from Chris's company. This enables the hacker to easily obtain the plain text content of all messages Chris's company sends. So after Chris sends the email from his computer to Katie at Zimbra.example, his message is handed off to the email server in his office called mail.company.example. Now Chris's email server also supports MTA STS. So before attempting to deliver Chris's email, it first checks to see if Katie's company has published the MTA STS policy. His server finds out that, yes, it does indeed have a cached copy of Katie's MTA STS policy, um, as shown in the lower right portion of the slide. Since Chris has previously emailed Katie within the last few weeks, this is a fairly fresh copy. So next, Chris's email server requests the, uh, Katie's DNS record for underscore MTA-STS 
.zimmer.example, and the purpose is to check the ID value to see if it's changed. It receives a response back of ID equals 2022-0510-01, which is the same ID we saw from the previous slide. So Chris's server knows that there has been no changes whatsoever to Katie's uh, STS policy since it was last checked. So next, Chris's email server connects to Katie's bail1.zimmer.example server using the SMTP protocol with a plain text, non-encrypted connection over TCP port 25. Katie's server then replies with a short greeting, including her server's host name of mail1.zimmer.example, and it advertises its supported features, including the 250-start TLS feature. Now, Chris's mail server uh, then sends the start TLS command, as you might expect, but instead it receives a response of 454 TLS not available due to a temporary reason. This response was not from Katie's Ember mail server at all, but instead has been forged by the hacker's malware running on Chris's firewall as part of a man in the middle attack. Now, since Katie's MTA STS policy is in enforcing mode, again, as we can see on the lower right corner of the, the slide, Chris's server immediately closes the SMTP connection without even attempting to deliver the email. Now, Chris's email is now marked as what's called a soft fail, meaning that his email server will retry the email delivery later on. But if later connection attempts still fail to get it through to Katie's server using encryption, then eventually the email will later bounce back to Chris as a hard or permanent failure, uh, marking it as undeliverable, essentially. Now, as a result, Chris's email never passes through the company's firewall. So the criminal hacker intercepting the firewall's traffic never even receives a copy of Chris's email message in this instance. Now, as you can see from this illustration, MTA SDS can be quite effective at preventing a man in the middle attack. Uh, while it's not totally immune from all attacks, MTA SDS is definitely an improvement over the alternative of just relying on opportunistic encryption alone. <clears throat> so let's switch gears now and let's look at another standard that will give you valuable insight into uh, when your email server is under attack. So there's a standard called TLS uh, RPT, uh, which is an acronym for Transport Layer Security Reporting, but you're going to hear me refer to it through this webinar as TLS Report. So this was introduced in 2018 as a companion uh, standard to the same or by the same group who authored the MTA STS standard. Now TLS's rep TLS Report's purpose is to create a feedback loop for you, giving you insights into when senders' emails are being delivered successfully to your email server, but more importantly, when things are going wrong too. So examples might include uh, when a man in the middle attack is in progress, uh, when there is a misconfiguration of your server's SSL certificates, or you have expired certificates on your email server, or even a broken MTA SDS policy file, um, or another instance is uh, your mail servers are not answering email senders. So there's a lot of things um, that I mentioned that you would definitely want to know about as an email administrator uh, before your users um, suddenly uh, come after you because email stops working. Um, now, it serves a very similar purpose as DMARC's aggregate reporting feature, again, enabling you to quickly spot problems and apply fixes. So let's again use an example to show you how you can set up TLS report to start receiving reports. So having successfully set up her MTA SDS policy, Katie now wants to set up monitoring to catch any problems that might arise now or in the future. So recall that Katie's email address is katie at zimmer.example. So to start receiving reports for her email domain of zimmer.example, Katie will create a new DNS text record with a host name of underscore smtp dot underscore tls dot zimbra dot example. For the content of this record, she will use the v equals TLS RPT v1 semicolon keyword. And this indicates that this is a TLS report record using version one, the only version supported on the internet. And next, she adds the RUA equals mail to colon TLS RPT at zimbra.example keyword. The, this advises email senders to send all reports to the TLS reports at zimbra.example email address. Um, that Katie is basically dedicated to this purpose. Now, Katie could specify multiple reporting email addresses here in a common separated list if she wanted to. Um, but in reality, most, uh, most email reporters will only honor about the first one or two email addresses listed and generally ignore all the other addresses. 
If this sounds familiar, it's because it is. It's the same thing that happens with DMARC aggregate reporting too. So notice that there is no semicolon at the end of the RUA keyword and its value. This is not an omission on the slide, but is in fact and purpose and is required by the TLS report standard. So additionally, Katie could have provided an email address here for the RUA keyword that does not use her Zimbra.example domain. So for instance, if she wanted reports to go to uh, reports at somewhere.company, uh, this would be perfectly acceptable for TLS report. Now this is unlike DMARC, where you have to specifically create another DNS text record on that other domain, in this case, somewhere.company, um, to allow those reports to come through. With TLS report, that's not necessary. You need only put it here in this one place, and those reports will simply be sent to that other location. So senders will generally send you these reports about every 24 hours and they will be sent as text files that are gzipped email attachments. Now for Windows users, the free 7-zip app is pretty useful for decompressing these gzip files, um, and the text files are going to be formatted in JSON. So you will need a tool to parse JSON into a readable format, but the good news is if you do an online search for keywords of JSON parser, uh, you're going to find any number of options to do this. Now the reports are supposed to be DKIM signed by each reporter for email authentication purposes. Essentially, if you wanted to, giving you the ability to ensure that that report really came from Google or that report really came from Microsoft and so on. And basically the reporter, uh, if they have no other option of getting an email through to you, even if it violates your MTA SDS policy, they will send you that report as a plain, over plain text without encryption if absolutely necessary. Now this can sometimes happen, uh, for example, again, if there's a problem with uh, the syntax of your MTA STS policy, or maybe your SSL certificates are somehow invalid or expired. Again, in those cases, these reports will still continue to come through no matter what. So when you have everything correctly configured with MTA STS, these reports will contain relatively little information. But if there are man in the middle attacks underway, or your SSL certificates on your email server have expired and you don't realize it, or have otherwise become invalid somehow, your email server is not, or, or even if your email server is not consistently answering email senders, uh, these reports are going to show you what exactly is going on, giving you a very important insight on how to pinpoint the problem. So let's take a look at what's in a typical TLS report uh, when all is well and there are no problems. <clears throat> in this example, we can see that Google has sent a TLS report, along with the start and end dates for this report in a human readable format. Uh, now Google has included their contact information along with the unique report ID. And in the policy section, it shows us that this report is for MTA SDS, uh, for an MTA SDS policy, and it includes a copy of the policy file that Google is currently using uh, for email sent to Katie's email domain of zimbra.example. So in the summary section, there's some basic statistics here showing that Google was able to deliver 15 emails successfully uh, to Katie's email server with uh, using encryption. And zero of those message, messages failed to be delivered because encryption was unavailable. So again, this is a best case scenario. Everything is working exactly as it should be. Now in this second example report, the first portion is pretty much the same as we saw on the previous slide. But you will now notice in the summary section near the bottom of the slide, it is now showing four email deliveries from Google that failed for Zimbra.example. Um, on the right of the slide, there's also another new uh, section called uh, failure details. These are normally in a single continuous report, but I have simply broken it into two images here so it fits on the slide. Now we can see that while 11 emails were sent by Google to the email server successfully with encryption, four of those failed to send. Now the failure details section on the right of the slide gives us an important hint of what may be going on. In the failure details section, there's a line called result type, and you'll notice that it says certificate expired, suggesting that the SSL certificate on Katie's uh, mta2.zembra.example email server must have expired at some point during the last 24 hours, causing all subsequent email deliveries to fail since Google could not send those using start TLS. And it was trying to use essentially an expired SSL certificate 
which is of course in violation of Katie's MTA SDS policy. So if you would like a more complete list of the types of errors that this report might include, I've uh, added a URL at the bottom of the slide, and that's a great reference as to all the different possibilities that might appear in that field. Again, it covers quite a variety of use cases, um, but the list is not so long that it's overwhelming. So to wrap up this introduction to MTA STS and TLS report, let's discuss some best practices. So before publishing an MTA STS policy, ensure that the prerequisites are all being met. This means that all mail servers included in your DNS MX records must have a valid SSL certificate issued by a certificate authority. Again, it doesn't matter exactly which certificate authority is, it just must be a certificate authority, be that Let's Encrypt or a commercial vendor. The second requirement is that all of your mail servers must have SSL certificates that exactly match both the server's host name and the DNS MX record names. This means that when an email sender looks up the DNS MX record for Katie at Zimbra.example, and the MX record he gets back is mail1.zimbra.example, then the SSL certificate on the email server must exactly match the mail1.zimbra.example name. Wildcard uh, SSL certificates can be used here so long as they still allow the same uh, name matching to occur. So a third requirement is that it, uh, the mail servers must support an encryption protocol of at least TLS uh, v1.2. Now you've heard me mention this several times, and again, this is kind of a theme with anything MTA STS. It always must use TLS version 1.2. Now the MTA STS standard does not go as far as defining a minimum encryption cipher. Um, and by cipher, of course, I'm referring to things like uh, AES and DES and Blowfish and, and a lot of other weaker standards like that. But it's in your best interest to use strong ciphers here. Um, and this is described in the Zimber Wiki article URL shown on the slide. Now your email servers must also have opportunistic encryption support enabled. This basically means they support the start TLS command. Preferably, this should apply to both your inbound and your outbound email servers, even though MTSDS is only concerned with your inbound in this instance. Now, the commands to check this were included earlier in this webinar, and again, if you need to replay this back later, it will be on the YouTube channel for you too. So when publishing your first MTA STS policy on the web server, you need to ensure that your web server, again, has a valid SSL certificate, so it can't be self-signed, and that name needs, and the certificate needs to be for the name mta-sts.yourdomain. Now an encryption protocol uh, needs to be also configured on the web server uh, to use, again, at least TLS version 1.2. Now the Mozilla site on the slide can be really helpful if you're unsure of how to get strong uh, encryption ciphers on your server. Um, it's in fact a great opportunity to improve your encryption ciphers to a strong level at the same time as when you're changing your protocol from uh, maybe a, a earlier version back up to TLS 1.2 or 1.3. So choose the mode and the max age values for your MTA STS policy carefully. Now, when getting started with MTSDS, you should always start with a mode setting of testing in your MTA STS policy. The none mode in this instance can safely be skipped. Now, this is a contrast to what we talked about earlier with DMARC, where I strongly advise not skipping none. Um, this is a different situation. In this case, MTSDS skipping none is perfectly safe. So immediately following when you set after following after you've set this up. You're going to want to set up monitoring again with TLS report so that you can see how email senders would normally apply your MTA STS policy. Because again, remember with the testing mode, they're not actually applying it. They're simply evaluating it, telling you how they would apply it, but not actually taking action with it. So if your email server uh, is basically still accepting plain text uh, emails, uh, that's still going to be allowed, even if your MTA STS policy would otherwise uh, say something different. So I would recommend to you that if you're getting started with this, try to start with no less than at least one week of monitoring data with TLS report before considering progressing from uh, the testing to the enforce mode. Now, larger email sending domains may need a minimum of quite a few more weeks of monitoring data, because again, those environments tend to more, be more complex. Um, the purpose here, again, is to give you the opportunity to watch your TLS reports coming in 
and looking for anything that looks wrong. And a lot of those things I mentioned earlier, um, invalid certificates, invalid syntax in your uh, MTA SDS file, uh, policy file, things of that nature. So the max age keyword in your MTA STS policy should be at a minimum at least a few weeks, if not several months. Now, when email admins uh, hear this, they tend to panic a little bit. And the first reaction I often get when telling somebody this is, well, what happens if my mail server goes down and I need to quickly switch over to another MX server? Or what happens if we need to do an upgrade and I set my max age to a year or more? You don't need to worry. So the way the max age works in this context is it simply acts as a guideline for email senders of how long they should hold on to a copy of your, your STS policy. But in reality, you can change it whenever you want. And that's done just as easily by going into your DNS record and changing that ID value that we looked at. Again, that was the one that you could make a new number or an alphanumeric value. So again, there's really nothing stopping you here from setting that max age uh, value to a very long period of time. <clears throat> in fact, in some cases, it's quite common to see it set to a year or more, and that's perfectly okay. Um, and the, another reason to do this is that by setting it to a really long value like that, if for whatever reason, an email sender is prevented from checking your MTSTS DNS record, it still ensures that your policy is still in effect. Because as long as that particular email sender has sent you at least one email in, at some point in that past, um, they will have a cached copy of your policy. Um, and that can be really great in cases where uh, somebody is suffering from say a DNS uh, denial of service attack, or they're having a technical issue and their DNS server has gone down, or somebody has made a mistake and caused the syntax of that record to be invalid. There's, there's a lot of reasons really that this is a smart move to have a long value on that max age keyword. So similar to DMARC aggregate reports, you're going to find that the number of TLS reports you receive over time is likely to steadily increase as more email senders steadily adopt MTA SDS on the internet. Um, a lot of the larger email service providers are now getting on board with this. Um, the most recent one I heard of is Microsoft. Um, they are just recently introducing uh, support for this, I believe in the last few months. Um, Google, I believe already has it. Um, and some of the other uh, large email providers are quickly following suit. So chances are you're gonna keep getting more and more of these again as time goes on. Um, now presently, there are unfortunately not very many open source options available to help you uh, parse these reports and summarize them into say a graphical format. But there are quite a few commercial vendors um, who are specializing in DMARC ag aggregate reports who have expanded their reporting offerings to also parse uh, TLS report uh, emails as well. So if you have one of those services, definitely take advantage of it because it, it easily makes the, the uh, information uh, so much uh, easier to see at a kind of a, a overview essentially. Um, but again, uh, those are really kind of your best choices um, unless you just happen to be a developer and want to put together your own script uh, to easily spot trends. So another thing to be aware of is to be careful of avoiding uh, duplicating any of your MTA STS or TLS report records in your DNS zone. Now this tends to be a problem with some of the larger, more complex zone files, uh, the kinds of DNS zones that might have uh, maybe a hundred or more resource records, maybe even a thousand. Um, now, when an email sender discovers that you have a duplicate MTA STS record or a duplicate TLS report record, what's going to happen is that the email sender is simply going to ignore your policy as though it didn't even exist. So essentially, it's like using the, um, the mode of none that we spoke of earlier. It just is simply ignored completely. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to answer any MTA, STS, or TLS report questions that you have before we get into the next topic of uh, BIMI. So there was one question uh, from Mark, and he's asking uh, if 90% of the servers on the internet support uh, transport encryption, why can't I skip all this and just require uh, encryption on my servers? How upset would my customers be if I make TLS mandatory? Uh, I, uh, I I'm with you on that one, Mark. I <laughs> I would love nothing more than that to happen. Um, it's important to understand, though, that MTA, STS, and Dane are truly stepping stones. They are meant to be uh, transitionary technologies, 
um, the designers of these technologies did not intend for us to be running on these things for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. Now, of course, that's possible that could happen. Um, but if you were to take the hardline approach of going into your postfix server in Zimbra and setting your SMTP security policy to uh, require encryption at all times, I can pretty much guarantee you, you will lose no less than 20, maybe 30% of your email traffic almost instantaneously. I mean, it's going to happen for a lot of different reasons. I know you're probably thinking, oh, well, 90%, that should only be 10%. Well, Again, these are averages, so your mileage is going to vary, um, and that number is coming from Google, and given their size, they talk to a lot of different email service providers, but you might have customers that don't talk to as many email providers, so your, your mileage on this might only be 60% of senders, or maybe 40% of senders, it may, be, it may look a lot different, so that 90% uh, percentage can be a little bit deceptive. Thank you very much, uh, Randy, for taking that question. Other than that, I uh, answered all the questions uh, on the fly, so you're ready to go. Okay, great. So uh, BIMI is what we're gonna get into next. And BIMI is an acronym for Brand Indicators for Message Identification. Now it is one of the newest email standards that will be covered in this webinar series literally having just emerged as an evolving standard last year in 2021. BIMI is not considered an email security standard on its own, but rather has significant dependencies on email authentication standards like SPF and DKIM and DMAR. So it tends to make sense to bring it up in this context. Now, in fact, BIMI closely mimics many of the concepts found in both DKIM and DMARC. So if you were already familiar with those two standards, BIMI is going to very quickly feel familiar in how it operates, because again, it uses a lot of the same syntax. And BIMI's purpose is to create a standardized means for an organization to have their logos appear as a kind of uh, avatar next to email messages a recipient receives in their inbox from an organization. On the right of the slide, you can see an example of what different BIMI avatars or logos would look like in a typical situation. Now, prior to BIMI, a lot of the large email providers have had these, uh, this avatar capability for a very long time, but the process of getting your logo listed with these email providers uh, was piecemeal at best. What often ended up happening was each provider had a different uh, inconsistent and seemingly arcane process or set of rules that each organization had to go through just to get their logo listed. So maybe you've accomplished that goal with Gmail, now you go over to Microsoft and it's a completely different set of rules and a completely different set of processes. And of course, this doesn't scale. Um, it becomes impossible for an organization to go from email provider to provider, trying to uh, basically satisfy each provider's different rules. So BIMI is essentially a way to standardize this. It, it, it stops the chaos essentially. Um, now BIMI is also introducing a standardized means for an organization to attest that they are a legitimate trademark owner and that they have the necessary rights to use a given logo. And this is kind of a big deal because one of the earlier concerns when BIMI started coming out as a standard was of course abuse. What is stopping somebody from putting something say inappropriate as a logo next to somebody's email or abusing it for harassment or spam? There's, there's all sorts of different things that people could do um, with this. Um, sorry here, I, my slide did not advance. There we go. So in this example, um, Katie wants to prepare her company's logo for use with BIMI. So let's walk through this and see how this works from the beginning. So as a first step, Katie is going to need to obtain um, Adobe Illustrator or work with a graphic designer who has access to this app, uh, basically so her company logo can be imported into Illustrator. Now, Illustrator happens to be an app that allows saving to a file format called SVG Tiny Version 1.2. Now, this file format just ends up being the closest to the SVG portable secure format that the BIMI standard actually requires all organizations to use for their brand logos. I know that seems very, very specific, but again, consider that this standard is barely a year old. And the discussion and the standards track right now is that they are looking at opening this up to other graphic formats. But the, uh, the essentially the need to use SVG in this case 
is that what is happening is when these logos display next to a given email in a uh, recipient's mailbox, it is not actually going out to your web server and pulling that graphic in every single time somebody opens their inbox. What the email provider is actually doing is after uh, you pass their authentication process, again, using BIMI, um, they will grab that logo from your web server and they will actually embed it within the email. So it literally becomes almost an attachment of sorts, an inline attachment, if you will, to that email. That's what the SVG uh, format especially is useful for because SVG is essentially text. It's a vector graphics format. Um, so uh, one of the other concerns here is that a company's logo uh, may need to be cropped because BIMI requires a logo to be perfectly square. Now, this is because some of the email providers are going to display the organization's logo as an avatar within a square. Others are going to use rounded edges and perhaps a circle. And you can see some examples there on screen what happens. So if you end up needing to crop your logo to do this, it's obviously important that your logo is generally as centered as possible because there's no real way to control or predict what an email uh, service provider is going to do uh, when they display this in their customers' inboxes. Um, sorry, my slide did not advance here again. Bear with me one moment. We are seeing uh, step four yeah. now. The slides are moving, but my notes are not. Sorry, everybody, little technical issue here, unfortunately. Okay, um, I'm gonna wing this, so <laughs> sorry, everybody. Um, so when we're dealing with step three, um, one of the really helpful pages in getting your hands around uh, what type of graphic format is needed is by using that URL there. Now, BIMIgroup.org, they are the official standards body behind the BIMI effort. So if there's ever going to be a source of good information, that's it. Um, of course, the other, only other authoritative source of information is the RFC on the BIMI standard, should you wish to read it. Um, but again, this website is pretty good. Um, and that page, uh, that Creating BIMI SVG logo files, has a great deal of, of helpful hints on there to help you ensure that your logo for your company is optimized as much as possible. I believe they also have recently introduced a couple of tools on there uh, to automate some of the steps of doing this. Um, one of the earliest problems that has emerged with creating your logo for BIMI is that um, oftentimes, even after the image comes out of Illustrator in the SVG format, um, it is quite common to actually need to open that uh, so-called image file up into a text editor and make a couple of minor but manual tweaks in, in the actual text of the file. Uh, again, I know this sounds very arcane and, and a little bit uh, iffy, but it's, it's, again, because of the newness of the standard. And this is something I'm pretty sure they're going to refine for you over time. So in step four, um, Katie has her SVG file now complete. Uh, and it now meets the BIMI requirements uh, precisely. So she can load that, uh, uh, sorry, she can upload that BIMI image file, that SVG file to a location of her choice. Now it's important to understand here that that image file does not necessarily need to go onto uh, Katie's domain. Um, if she wanted to, she could simply put it out on a generic uh, AWS server or uh, some Oracle or Azure server, wherever she wants to put it, it does not matter. Um, there is no um, expectation in the BIMI standard that those, those images, those logo images, will be served from the same uh, name that is associated with the email account. So uh, basically it is to inform uh, email recipients that uh, Katie has now created a, a BIMI logo or a BIMI compatible logo for her company, she needs to create a DNS text record. Now she's going to create a text record to begin with of default dot underscore BIMI dot Zimbra dot example. Now, you may recognize this format from DCAM, and it's because it's almost exactly the same concept here. Default happens to be like a DCAM selector. Um, and the idea here with BIMI is that you can have any number of selectors you want. And you may be thinking, well, why would I do that? Because my company only has one logo, right? Well, consider this use case. Let's say that you would like to have a different logo for the holidays. 
maybe Christmas time, maybe uh, July 4th, maybe a, a spring sale, who knows what it might be. So you could essentially create these different SVG versions of your logo, create different uh, DNS records using these different selectors in your DNS. And then the way that you tell email recipients which one that you want to uh, use is you're essentially including a header within the email and you're basically informing recipients, I want to use my logo with this selector name. Um, and I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that header is called uh, bimi-selector. Um, if anybody is, knows otherwise, feel free to correct me on that, but I believe that's correct. And that's essentially all there is to it. So by creating this DNS text record, we're essentially putting v equals bimi1, again, specifying it's a bimi record, it's version one, the only version supported. And the L, uh, it, it is actually a lowercase L, by the way, that is not an I, uh, but that lowercase L equals means location. And it's basically the URI path to where uh, Katie's uh, local image can be found. Again, using that uh, SVG format specified by the Bimi format. Now, there is another option here, and I don't know, Yes, I do have it on the other slide. Again, you'll have to forgive me without my notes. I'm winging it here a little bit. Um, so there is another option that BIMI supports. Now, you may remember in the earlier slide, I said that BIMI introduces the ability for trademark owners to provide additional validation that they actually own the logo that they want to use. This is pretty important to, again, a lot of the email recipients um, because, again, they're interested in preventing abuse uh, no matter what. And so what you're going to encounter here with BIMI is you're going to encounter uh, certain email providers who, if you have a properly uh, formatted uh, SVG image and you've set up your DNS record correctly, they're generally going to let you use your image. Um, now, they're, of course, are going to have probably some additional metrics internally, and they're not going to disclose those to you. Um, it might be the reputation of your email. Are you frequently a spammer? Do you frequently send malware? Um, have they never heard from you before? things like that. And they're going to use those things to weigh their decision as well of if they do or do not use your logo. But in essence, um, that's really all there is as a minimum bar to entry. But there are other email providers. Gmail happens to be one of them. And what they are doing is they are requiring uh, for your logo to appear next to uh, emails as a BIMI image or avatar, you must have a trademarked logo. And the way that you prove that, in this case to Gmail, is you have to go out to one of the certificate authorities. Um, I believe DigiCert is one, and I think Intrust is the other, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and now this is not a cheap process. Um, the price, as I recall, ranges between $1,000 to $1,500 just for a single certificate. And what they're doing is they're basically taking your logo, they're taking your trademark uh, registration number, uh, wherever that may be registered in the world, and they're basically validating it with the government authority. Now, if that comes back as valid and you own that trademark, then essentially that certificate authority is going to send you a signed certificate. This is very much the exact same thing that you would get uh, for say an SSL certificate for your website, just for a different purpose. So the way this works, as you can see on the slide, is there's an additional um, uh, option and it's a letter A. And it basically refers uh, to what Mimi calls uh, an evidence file, uh, probably not the best name for it, but it essentially is a way for you to attest that you actually own the trademark and you have a digital certificate from a trusted certificate authority um, indicating that that's true. Now, this is basically having that A equals parameter set. That is, again, the minimum bar to entry to get places like Gmail to introduce your logo uh, next to the recipient's inboxes. But again, even then, it is still at Gmail's discretion if they want to uh, apply extra rules to you. Again, if they think you're not trustworthy or they think your domain's uh, suspicious, there's a lot of different things that can happen. So BIMI does not attempt to force a service provider's hands. They instead only attempt to standardize the process that it takes to get your image into a standard format that all email providers can use. Um, so again, it's it's not a guarantee that your image is always going to be used. Oh, and I'm sorry, it's on the slide there. DigiCert and Entrust Data Card, those are the two CAs that offer that. Okay, so BIMI is a relatively short discussion. Um, believe it or not, there's really not that much more to it. It is literally those parameters. Um, so let's open this up to questions. Thank you, Randy. I think you uh, winked that pretty well. Uh, there are no more questions. 
Oh, okay. So uh, we're also a little bit over time, so let's wrap it up. Okay, you got it. All right. So before publishing your first MTSDS policy, carefully check that all of the prerequisites described earlier in this webinar have been met. If any of those are skipped, this is going to often cause your MTSDS policy to be ignored by email senders. The second consideration is use a large max age value in your MTASTS policy to limit your exposure to short-term DNS outages that could cause email senders to ignore your published policy. You can always override this at any time by changing ID value in the MTASTS DNS text record as mentioned earlier. And also before attempting to set up BIMI, take the time to make sure that you have your DMARC setup uh, correct. I did not, I actually forgot to mention that a moment ago, but another uh, barrier to entry with BIMI is that you must have DMARC uh, configured and you must have a policy of quarantine or reject. If you are using the uh, ability in DMARC to apply it to only a percentage of your messages, that won't work. BIMI actually requires, again, quarantine being applied to 100% of your messages and the same with reject. Um, if you've not done that, then you can't use BIMI. All right, well, thank you so much for attending today's webinars. Um, appreciate your patience, and I hope you found it educational and appreciate and appreciate your time for attending. Um, if you do have any questions uh, as follow-up for me, and my contact information is there, and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you all very much for joining, and uh, see you all on the next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.